So let me pray, and we're going to dive into the last part of our series, learning more about God. Father, we thank you for your goodness. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are here. Spirit of sleepiness, spirit of distraction, spirit of fear. We say go. Holy Spirit, come. Right now, as we position our hearts and our minds to be focused on your word, may you speak an individual word to every one of us here, those who are watching online. Thank you, God, that you are good and you have good things to tell your children. And as we learn more about you, may you illuminate the scriptures to our minds and our, and our eyes. May you open our ears to hear, Holy Spirit, what you want to deposit. Lead us in this time. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, years ago, I'm talking probably uh, 2004, I was a high school pastor for a large church. Our high school group was about 160 high school-only children. And I got to minister to them at a young age. And I remember I had a small group for just the guys. We had 20 to 30 guys. We called the group Godly Beef. <laughs> That's where we, we met together just to study the word and eat some food and play some games. But I was blessed as a youth pastor. Somebody in the church donated $10,000 to our youth group room and said, this place is ugly. You need money to make it better. So here's a lot of money. Make it cool. That's what we did. We ripped out the carpet. And we put new flooring. We put up big projectors. We bought a pool table, foosball table, video games, all kinds of stuff. And it was awesome because in a youth group, there's, you need something to keep these kids active before service starts. If not, they're going to start pulling paint off the walls and, you know, breaking things. And so we kept them busy with games. And it also opened up the opportunity to just chat with them, fellowship. But there was one night in particular where I was with my godly beef boys and I realized maybe I had a problem with competition because there was one kid named Max. And Max is one of those kids that's good at everything. And I still talk to him to this day. So we're playing pool and he just kicks my butt. <laughs> I'm like, all right, you know, that was lucky, but um, why don't we try foosball? And then he just shattered me at foosball. And then I started getting a little frustrated. I'm like, all right, what about checkers? Beat me at checkers. Finally, it's like 45 minutes to an hour later and I'm on the Nintendo 64 playing Mario Kart with them, refusing to stop until I can beat them. At one point I just shouted out, okay guys, tonight's just gonna be a game night because I refuse to get beaten again. And at the end of the night, I'm like, um, I think the word of God might have been a little bit more important than uh, you winning and beating a 13-year-old kid. But I had this problem. I could not stop until I had a, a, a victory under my belt. And I share that dumb little story to illustrate that there is power in refusing to give up. There is power when Jesus says he has given us the victory. When we have the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead living inside of us, there should be this refusal to give up when God has given us a promise. So as we enter into the last installment of the series called I Am, learning about the names of God, we're going to discover Jehovah Nisi, God, my banner of victory, and explore what victory and what a refusing to give up can look like in our faith, in our community, and in our families. So we've looked at several different names of God. We looked at El Shaddai, God Almighty. We looked at Jehovah Rapha, God our healer. We looked at Jehovah Jireh, our provider. Last week, Jehovah Shalom, and how pregnant that word Shalom, peace, really is. And today we are going to finish off with Jehovah Nisi, my banner. And the King James Dictionary defines Nisi or a uh, banner uh, as this: something lifted up, a standard, a signal, a signal pole, sign, banner. Sign even a sail. You can imagine a ship with a, a sail that has a logo or a name attached to it is to declare something. Now, the, a, a banner is really used to show your allegiance to something. And, and that makes a little bit more sense when you think God is my flag. He's my banner. I understand Rafa healer. I understand Jaira provider. That's obvious and makes sense. But why would God be our flag? Now, when we look at this, we see that flags are used to declare what you're having allegiance to, but to also declare what you are promised to. And there's lots of ways even today that we still use flags or banners or signs as a way to demonstrate what we believe. So I actually have a few pictures here I want to show you. The first one we see this a lot is a picture of an Olympic athlete who will drape a flag around them. 
with the pride of saying, I'm an American or I'm from this country and I'm not only fighting today for my gold medal, I'm fighting for my country. I'm fighting who, for all who helped me get to this place. And it's oftentimes an emotional scene. And this next one, you know, we, we have uh, banners that demonstrate what our political affiliations are. Many times people will put banners, you know, on the front to help sway people to a specific party, but it, it really shows your true colors of, of what you believe with politics. I actually saw one of these yard signs that said, uh, 2024, any functioning adult. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this next one, sometimes our banners are actually stickers, and I love bumper stickers. They're my absolute favorite. This one, I love so much. Do you follow Jesus this close? <laughs> and that's making a statement, especially in Dallas. I just saw a news article that said Dallas ranks among one of the top 10 places in America as the worst drivers. And all of us can say, yes, we believe that. And then finally, sometimes banners and flags are used with an agenda with evil behind it. And we see protests, we see, and let me tell you, it was so hard to find an LGBT flag because there's like a thousand variations of it. Not only that, but you know, my wife walks into my office and sees gay flags all over my, my computer. I'm like, I can explain, right? <laughs> it look, it look weird. But th we see this a lot where it's, it's shoved down your throats. There's a, an agenda where our children are being attacked with not knowing what gender they want to be. And and it just goes on and on and on. But banners and signs, they explain what it is that, that we hold dear, what it is we see as important. But now we're seeing that, that with God, he is our banner. He is our victory. He is what we have allegiance to. It's all about Jesus. It's all about him. He's the one we fight for. He's the one we go after. And what's amazing is that with God is our banner, we're always on the winning side. See, back in, in, in Bible times, they didn't have the military technology we have today with GPS and radios and, and uh, you know, digital communication that goes out. So a banner in wartime, in Bible time, was a rallying call. It was, here's where we are. This is where your people, your army are at, and that's where we're going. So on the battlefield, you look for your banner. You look for your flag, and that's where your people are, and that's where you go. You know, I feel really bad for old school warfare. The person who had to bear the flag, he had no weapon. <laughs> so he's going out there with just a flag and he's always the first one to die. But, you know, that, that's the importance of what they, they hold as to what they're representing. You know, he is our banner and we are on the winning side. So when God declares himself Jehovah Nisi, our banner, our banner of victory, we can have a confidence, we can have a peace, and we have a rest that he's always at his work and we can just follow the good shepherd and surely goodness and mercy will follow us. Well, today we're gonna look at one of the first places we see Jehovah Nisi. It's found in Exodus chapter 17. I'm gonna read just a few verses of this. And as always, I'm reading out of the New American Standard. Again, that's Exodus 17, beginning in verse eight. This comes right after uh, the waters were bitter and the Israelites in a desert could not find something to quench their thirst. So Moses is told by God to strike the rock and water pours out. And then something happens. Uh, uh, the enemies that they did not obey God completely and wipe out came back to bite them. And we see uh, an awesome illustration of what the Lord does in his power. Beginning in verse eight, then Amalekite came and fought against Israel at Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, choose men for us to go out and fight against Amalek. Tomorrow I will station myself on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. And that staff of God wasn't a magic wand. It, it was a symbol of God's power, of Moses' influence, of his identity. Joshua did as Moses told him and fought against Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. When it came about when Moses held his hand up, that Israel prevailed, and when he let his hand down, Amalek prevailed. I mean, that's people are dying by just having your hands raised and your hands falling down. People's lives are on the line. But Moses' hands were heavy. They took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it, and Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side, one on the other. Thus his hands were steady until the sun set. So Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. 
And the Lord said to Moses, and this is awesome. He didn't say, just remember this or build a memorial. He said, write this in a book as a memorial and recite it to Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and named it, the Lord is my banner, Jehovah Nisi. It's the first time we see this. So there you have two men who are helping Moses keep his hand up so that Israel can have the victory. And let me just say, I have an Aaron and a Hur in my life. With Pastor Randy and with Pastor Wally, I got two amazing pastors on this team. When I say they lift my hands up, I truly honestly mean they go above and beyond to ensure that they take care of me, are praying for me, and encourage me. And there's something about the community of faith that helps you live in a sustained victory that Jesus brought to us. So awesome things that are happening in this portion of scripture. But one thing I noticed as I was studying this week is that every time I've introduced a new name of God, once they declare God's name, Jaira, uh, Rafa, in this case, Nisi, it says that whoever said that built an altar. Seems like every time there was a declaration of God's name, immediately following, there was an altar. And an altar is, is a wonderful thing in the Old Testament. It was a place of consecration. It was a place to commemorate what happened. Many times people would build an altar in Bible times as a tangible thing to show that here I had a special encounter with God. And we know in the Old Testament that uh, an altar was also a place of death. It was a place where animals were slaughtered. In the Old Testament Levitical law, it, you had sin. You would put your hand on a spotless and pure animal. And symbolically, your sin was transferring onto that innocent animal. And the innocence of that animal you took over and that sin was killed. It was slaughtered. But can you imagine how many animals you would have to kill on the, the sins that we do on a daily basis? So the altar was a place of, of sacrifice. In Hebrew, altar actually means slaughter. But now that we are in the New Testament, it's not an animal we're sacrificing, it's the flesh. So when we declare who God is, you are God, my banner of victory. I want to sacrifice my flesh. I want to kill my flesh in order that my soul, my spirit, my true identity can live forward and follow you into victory. God has an amazing promise for us. Not only the power that we have through the Holy Spirit, not only the authority that we have in Jesus Christ, but the promise of a loving and a powerful God that goes before us. So this morning, I wanna encourage you on a few things. They're in your bulletin that you can fill out if you're taking notes. A few things that'll help us to walk in sustained victory. Point number one is understand, past tense, you already have the victory. As a believer, we're not trying to get victory. Jesus took care of victory on the cross. So we are fighting from victory. We're not fighting for victory. And that's so incredibly important to understand. In 1 Corinthians 15, 57, it says, thanks be to God who gives us the victory in Christ Jesus. Now, victory in the Greek, in this specific verse, victory in the Greek means to triumph or to have a conquest. So in order to have a victory, you need a battle. In order to have a victory, you need a problem first. And that problem was sin. That problem was death. That problem was bondage by the enemy until Jesus died on that cross. And that stone rolled away and he walked out of that tomb, resurrected and alive. He defeated sin. He defeated death. And he defeated the enemy. The scriptures say in, in 1 John 3, 8, that the reason the son of man came was to destroy the works of the enemy. Hebrews 2, 14, he rendered the devil powerless. In, in Colossians, it says that he made the devil a public spectacle. That's what armies would do. They would march in after defeating a country or a people, and they would have the king of that conquered people at the end, tied up, bound, ridiculed, mocked, humiliated, but as a demonstration to say, you will never have to deal with this enemy ever again. He's on his way to death. That's what Jesus did to the devil. So we have the victory. And although the war has been won, there's still gonna be many battles in our lives. And there's some battles that God fights and some battles that we fight, but we're always gonna have a battle because Jesus promised us in this world, we will have trials and tribulations. So just because the war is over, we're still on this side of eternity. There's still free will in this world. We're still gonna fight things, but the beauty is that we're on God's team. We're on his side. He is our banner of victory. And we know that his promises will come to pass. The best way to walk out your victory 
is to stand on the word of God, to guard that aggressively. Jesus said that you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Some people will say that verse, Jesus will set you free. No, he doesn't set you free. He makes you. That's a transformation. It's kind of like the difference between a prisoner who escapes prison or a prisoner who is released from prison. They're both on the outside, but they're not both free. Only the one released is free. That's their declaration. That's their new identity. They're no longer an inmate. They are a citizen. But the one who breaks out is not a free man. They're a fugitive. So Jesus makes us free when we stand on the word of God. And the opposite of that, if the truth makes us free, what does a lie do? And yeah, we can't be bound by the enemy because he's been defeated, but we can be bound by his influence. We can be bound by his lies. And lies that build upon lies turn into a stronghold. And soon enough, we're so lost, we can't even hear the voice of the Father. We need to stand on truth. Jesus said he will make us free. We got to resist the lies and stand upon what he is telling us to do and watch how he delivers us. Watch how he works it out for our good. Second Chronicles 20, 17 says, you need not fight this battle. Stand and see the salvation of the Lord. I love that we serve a God who will fight for us. I love that we serve a God who is powerful and we can trust that he knows what he's doing and that nothing comes as a surprise to him. Exodus 14, 14, which many of us know, the Lord will fight for you. You only be still. And with that promise, with that encouragement, point number two, understand who is responsible for the victory. Understand who is responsible for the victory. I had a conversation with some pastors years ago because we were walking into kind of moving in the power of the Holy Spirit and praying for the sick and, you know, uh, speaking a word to, to people. And we're walking the church through that transition. And one of the pastors says, well, we have authority in, in Jesus. We can rebuke devils. We can do all that kind of stuff. But when do we pray and when do we take authority? Because remember, when Jesus said, heal the sick, he didn't say pray for the sick. He said, heal the sick. He didn't say pray for demons to lead. He said, cast them out. That's different than a prayer. So I was focusing on that and I said, well, I think this is what we need to dwell on. We should pray for only things that God can do that man can't. And we take authority over the things in which he has given us permission. So I can take authority over a devil. I can take authority over a sickness, but I can't make somebody get saved. I can only pray, Holy Spirit, can you woo their heart to salvation? God, can you let your kindness lead them to salvation? There's things that we pray for that only God can do. And there's things we take authority that he's given us the power to do. And we have to understand the difference. Now we also have to take that and understand in our battles in life, there's a time to fight and a time to stand and watch the Lord fight. There's some battles that you may be facing that were never your battle to begin with. There may be some battles you're facing today that you're not seeing the victory because it's not yours to gain. You're supposed to step back and watch the Lord work it out for you. And there's other times where you're the one who needs to fight. Stop being distracted. Get your nose in that word. Wrestle it out. Tarry and pray until the answer comes fast so that you can see a breakthrough. There are times when we fight and there are times when the Lord fights for us and we need to discern when it's God's responsibility and ours. And that goes the same with our businesses, with our families, even with this church. I was at a conference one time and one of the pastors says, you know, this is a, a, a nice large church and you didn't start that way. What did you do to grow the church? And, and I know not everybody goes to pastors conferences, but that annoys me like nothing else. I'll meet a pastor for the very first time. Oh yeah, I'm the pastor of Southgate, Duncanville. You probably pass by. You know where Costco is? Across the highway. That's where my church is. That's how I always say it. And the first thing they ask me, it's never, how long have you been there? What's your story? How many people are in that church? Why does that matter? And we get to this point where pastors and leaders get obsessed with growing the church because somehow the more people you have in your church, the more successful you are as a preacher the more successful you are as a ministry. Now, I live by this conviction. If I'm the one that makes the church grow with marketing and with ministries and with charisma, if I'm the one that grows the church, it's my responsibility to keep it. But if God in his presence draws people here and he grows the church, that's his responsibility. 
And that frees me up to simply follow his will and to obey his call and his command and to just leave it at him. So we need to clearly hear and obey God so that we can see whose responsibility is when we fight. Number three in this final point, understand your role with the victory. So even though God sometimes is the one fighting our battles, even though it's God who has the victory, even though it's Jesus who overcame the grave, we still have a role in that victory as good stewards, fighting when he calls us to fight, praying when he calls us to pray, interceding, all of those things. And the Israelites in this portion of scripture in Exodus 17, they were battling an enemy they should not have battled. Because God told them clearly when they came towards the promised land, you need to wipe out these nations. Otherwise, they'll come back to bite you. And that's exactly what happened in this, this piece of scripture here. They came back to be a snare and a stumbling block to them. We got to completely eradicate things out of our heart that are not in God's heart. We shouldn't have thoughts in our minds that are not in God's minds. Let, let me try to explain this a little bit better. How many people here hate snakes? Snakes. Don't like them. And, you know, when I get to heaven, my first question to God is not going to be like, hey, explain how you created this world. Or I, I just want to worship you. I'm going to be like, hey, God, i um, been thinking about this my whole life. Why snakes? Why scorpions? Why roaches? Why mosquitoes? Like, that had to have been part of the fall and Satan's desire, not yours. Truly, it couldn't have been yours, Lord. That's my first question. So many of us don't like snakes, especially poisonous ones. Now, what if I said, I came over to your house and I said, I I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I had a pillowcase filled with six baby rattlesnakes and I accidentally let them loose in your house. <laughs> but don't worry, I got five of them. So there's only one. So we're good, right? Many of us would be like, yeah, right. We wouldn't sleep until we found that. Just like those water bugs, those big old roaches that sometimes get into our house. If I see one, I'm not going to bed. I'm flipping furniture over until I get that little booger. I don't, I'm not going to wake up in the morning with the roach on my face. No. So you wouldn't give up, especially if you had children. You wouldn't give up until all the snakes were out of your house. So why is it that we get to a certain level of ridding sin and lies and bitterness and unforgiveness, but not all of it out of our heart. See, the Israelites, they, they obeyed God for the most part, but they left little bits, a foothold for the enemy to come back and bite them. So if you want to partner with God's victory, you got to partner with him in your obedience, partner with him in standing on the word of God, partner when the spirit says, I want you to move in power and you believe so. We got to get it out of our hearts. We can't have just a little bit to sticking around to fester and give the devil an opportunity to speak to you. We're supposed to be good stewards of the victory Jesus already provided for us. And I think that one of the keys is that how we steward the good times in our lives can greatly impact and determine the bad times of our lives. Don't wait until you need a word from God to get a word. Jesus, when he told his disciples, this kind only comes out with fasting and prayer. He wasn't telling them, do more things, do more performance. He was saying, in a sense, if you had been fasting, if you had been praying, when you approach these demons, you wouldn't have been fearful of them. You wouldn't have been fearful of men. You wouldn't have been intimidated. You would have had the confidence had you been fasting and praying. And the same with, with our victory, how we take care of the good times when there are no battles. We can hear God more clearly, store up in your heart truths, store up in your heart strength so that when the battle comes, when the trials that Jesus promised come, you are ready. You have a confidence. There's something about knowing you're going to win. You know, like as a, as a good uncle, as a good youth pastor, as a good dad, I never let kids beat me at anything. There's that competition problem again, right? <laughs> I don't care if you're three years old. If you play Mario Kart with me, I'm smoking you. It's just, it's going to happen. <laughs> we have to be stored up. We have to be ready. We have to have the confidence like beating a three-year-old in Mario Kart. I'm going to win this one. <laughs> Leaning on God who tells us he has given us the victory. And finally, let me just say this, that as a, a, a pastor to my family here, don't give up. I believe that if you want to see the victory you have been contending for, declaring for, praying for, the true key is just don't give up. 
God has given you a promise and it may not make sense right now. It may not look like it's ever going to happen. That's the definition of depression, where you give up hope that it'll ever change. But let me tell you, God has given you the victory and hold true to him. I've learned as I close this series, I've learned three powerful things discovering the names of God. One, I discovered more about God's nature and his attributes. I've fallen more in love with God in these last five weeks. I've also discovered every single week, as I mentioned at the sermon last week, every time I preach on a name of God, I have the temptation to not believe that name of God. I have that temptation to have that fear that it's never going to get better. So when I preach, he is our provider. I have the temptation of unbelief to say, but I'm still broke. Or if he is my healer, but I'm still sick, we still have the temptation to not believe. And I want to combat that. I want truth to be so confident in my heart that when I say he's healer, I believe it with every fiber in my being. And finally, God is so unchanging. Our cute little denomination, the four squares we have on our back wall, Hebrews 13, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the unchanging one. If he promised you back then, he's going to promise you again. If he healed you back then, he'll heal you again. We already have the victory in God. Let us walk in it. Let us be good stewards of what God has deposited in our hearts. So Father, we thank you for your goodness today. And we thank you for an awesome opportunity to celebrate, to celebrate your love, to celebrate the power of your word, to celebrate our dear friends who you've given nine decades on this earth. Thank you, God, for our sweet afternoon of fellowship. Thank you for the food. Thank you for the wonderful ladies who helped and organized this and got here early. Thank you so much, Lord. And now as we go about and enjoy this afternoon, may we go in your peace and in your joy, overflowing in your love. Bless my friends here. May you prosper them, bless them, heal them, deliver them, and ultimately draw them closer to you. We love you today, God. Go before us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the food is nice and hot and ready, uh, but we will have people up here who would love to pray with you if you're in need of any prayer. Otherwise, let's enjoy a great time of food and fellowship.